Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. So here's hope as a bird, which you've heard in the, she's heard in the storm. People have heard it in the storm. People have heard it, um, uh, heard it in the warmth of life. And it always gives hope, even in the chillest and most extreme conditions, but it never asks anything of her. So it's a beautiful image, all to personify through a bird and through those feathers and through the singing, a, the idea of hope. And imagery is this uh, part of the poem that's probably central to it. It's, it's the element that tells us, uh, that appeals to us in our five senses. You know, seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, tasting. And in, and in fact, it's probably more seeing, but the other senses come in play. And often what we think of with the image is a picture. So you think of a picture in a photo album that takes you back to that time. So that's what an image does in a poem. It takes you somewhere and puts you in that place. So these images, start to work in our mind in a way that probably subconsciously that we feel something associated with it. I, I, I kind of break imagery into a couple of different ways. For examples, imagery can be visceral or it can also be and or and. It can be symbolic. It can have a sound effect, you know, have a sound sense to it. It can also be an allusion to some other um, literature or piece of history or mythology. Green Buddhas on the fruit stand, we eat the smile and spit out the teeth. And of course you can see immediately this watermelon being described as this big green Buddha um, waiting to be eaten. And as they eat it, they eat the smile. You know how you cut a watermelon, watermelon into a smile and you eat that and you spit the seeds out. In this case, you spit the teeth out because the smile is the, are the seeds in the watermelon smile. Visceral imagery that you can feel, taste. It's really, you can, you can, you can just sense it right there in your experience. So if you say ice, an icy person, that person, she was icy towards me. Uh, you immediately get this feeling of a cold shoulder, someone treating you badly. His, his game was on fire today. You get a feeling of someone who's energetic, doing really well. Fire sometimes might excite us, but it also may be associated with anger. We may feel threatened by it, fearful of it. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice, from what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if I had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. And of course, you have this, uh, this dilemma. Will the world come to an end in an ice age or will it come to the end by burning up? But this idea that the earth will end in fire or ice is the crucial dilemma of this little poem. And yet it's just those two images, which are more than just the feeling of fire and ice. They're also of a calamity, uh, an apocalypse that could bring the end of everything. An image can take the, the symbolic and make the symbolic very visceral. It's symbolic and yet at the same time you feel it. Here's a good example, bouncing the ball. You can hear the alliteration of B, bouncing ball, B, B, and you hear that bouncing ball as well as see it. But there's also one in T.S. Eliot's love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, when J. Alfred Prufrock is uh, talking about himself and he says, 
I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. And you can hear, you can see immediately this reference, but also this picture of Hamlet, who is the one who said, to be or not to be. And Prufrock says, nor meant to be. And there's a play on that line as well as a, an allusion to not being Hamlet at all, being the opposite of Hamlet. So you can see the imagery can be used in so many different ways in a poem. Avocado, its dark jade skin holds butter green like lust that hangs upon a tree. Palm it gently, pull passion down, split pith in two, and double fun. And what you get with this are a number of images that are visceral, like the skin of the avocado, the butter that's green inside of it, the palm that's pulling it down, the pith that's split in two so that you can eat it together with somebody else. But also you get the symbolic, you get this kind of forbidden fruit suggested because it's lust on a tree that's hanging before you. It might even, you might even think of the Garden of Eden and the forbidden fruit. And there's also the forbidden passion of experiencing the fruit with another person because you're enjoying this pleasure. And you double the fun just as Adam and Eve, you know, fell together. Um, so you have all of this stuff mixed together, the visceral, the symbolic, as well as the sound effect of the split pith. You hear that kind of splitting sound happening and you have the uh, double fun, you have that play on the pleasure doing this. Um, those are all good examples of how imagery can have an effect on the reader.